without further ado, Bill and Ian. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here to talk about uh, something that was really concerned me uh, when I was doing some work at NSA, uh, and that's the ethics in what I was doing. Um, the basic problem, I mean, uh, in 1997, I became uh, the technical director of what I like to call the world, uh, which simply meant uh, I, I was the technical director of about 6,000 analysts at NSA. They managed all the analysis and reporting of all the information in the world, uh, except for ELINTS, uh, which was uh, signals by machines. So this was basically all transactional relationships between people. Uh, and they had a real problem. Uh, they couldn't figure out what they had. Even back then, there was too much data for them to look at. They couldn't figure out and see any threats coming uh, from terrorists or from uh, a criminal activity or even from militaries that were using the Internet uh, or the phone network. So uh, it, uh, it was really a major problem for them, and uh, it was my job to try to solve that. So I tried to look at that and see, well, what could I do to make that a meaningful uh, or pull out meaningful information and make it manageable for the analysts to be able to figure these things out and actually report them so they might have a chance to stop, uh, you know, terrorist attacks before they happen and save lives. So <clears throat> that, was the, that, was the, uh, that was the that was the requirement that I worked against and I started to say, well, if I looked at it this, the way I looked at the Soviet problem, I used the metadata to see into the content of what they were doing. So in other words, it was Instead of looking, if you looked at the content of data, you were buried immediately. Um, and that was true back then, because even now, even when they didn't have the capacity to collect as much data as they can today, uh, they had that problem then. Uh, because the analysts would get 50,000 items a day, and they'd have to go through, you know, all of these 50,000 items to find something. Once they found something, they had to report. They had to stop and report it. That meant all that time was lost looking at the other data. And so they never got through anything any day. So the next day it came along, another 50,000 items. They have to do the same, and it was a repeat day after day. And they kept saying they can't, they, they need some help and training to figure this out. So the, the, my, my approach was to say, well, I use metadata on the, the Soviet problem, and it worked just fine, so I'll use metadata here. Uh, that metadata would allow me to group and cluster things into communities and all their activities together so that I can look into what they're doing and say, uh, this is the community I want, and I'll pull all that data out and everything else I'll let go right by. So I got rid of the manage, uh, I didn't have a problem managing content because I didn't take it in. So that was the first thing I did to filter it right up front. Um, and then <clears throat> we started graphing all the metadata. And uh, at that point, this is where it became a serious problem. Because now we knew the relationships of everybody in the world with everybody else in the world. In other words, I knew everybody's social network in every environment. Uh, and this was not a, and a, and to me, it was not an acceptable view into people's lives. It was a direct violation of their, you know, privacy rights. I could, I could deduct I, from any of the metadata and relationships. You can figure out what people are involved in, what medical problems they have, who they're, who they're having. Basically, you can assert, assert uh, people that are having affairs. You can look at all kinds of metadata like that and figure out lots of ac activity of people without having any of the content whatsoever. So I had a real problem here. <clears throat> how can we? How can we? Uh, pull out all the data about people who were really doing bad things and give it to our analysts to be able to figure out what was going on and take action against it, uh, and yet protect the privacy of everybody else. We, we, even though we had the metadata, we wanted to do that. So we just decided to encrypt all the metadata. And so that uh, it was never in any other form other than encrypted inside NSA so that even the NSA analysts couldn't tell who they had. So, any, and uh, as you'll see in the field, uh, some of the uh, slides I have uh, even later, the FBI or CIA couldn't tell because they have direct access to it too. And all the collection from CGA, GCHU, NSA stores, and they've got access to that too for long periods of time, five to ten years at least. So, uh, that, that, <clears throat> that uh, encryption gave the protection to the people so that uh, no one could tell, even inside NSA, who they were looking at. They could still... We did, a, we did a unique encryption, so we got rid of homomorphic mapping. We didn't have to do that, okay? We worked a way of uh, getting around that, you know? So uh, the point was to add layers of complexity in the encryption, not the single encrypted in a one layer, but add the layers and keep that single layer encrypted, but make the complication in the layers so that when you get to, to
to uh, uh, encrypting, you always get the same result from a given input at any time. That eliminates homomorphic mapping. So that, that was the way we got around that. And so now we could build graphs uh, with encrypted versions and, and look at people as an encrypted version and say, what, the, the, what they, were they doing? Is there probable cause to target them? And so on from that activity. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that was one of the things that uh, NSA ran across uh, when they were looking at some of our collection. They said, here's one guy we have to target. So let's, uh, they wanted to look at him to find out who it was. So they called me in at 6 o'clock at night on Friday because they couldn't decrypt the value to see who it was to target. That was the whole point of it, right? NSA analysts weren't supposed to know who they were targeting until they could show probable cause. And I said, that's the whole point of this exercise. That's why we did it this way. Well, at the same time, uh, <clears throat> we, I went to the terrorist surveillance program, uh, the office where they were looking at all terrorism around the world, and I said, uh, how many sites uh, contribute information to you to analyze terrorism around the world? Uh, just give me a list of them. And, uh, and they gave me 18 sites. So uh, the program we developed cost from the beginning about $3.2 million from scratch to develop. And we are running 24 hours a day for about a year and a half in three separate sites. Uh, so I was after terrorism, the main target. This is like mid-2000 that I, we did this. So then they gave us 18 sites. So by the end of, uh, by November of 2000, we had all the program running from beginning to end, from antennas all the way, and all the sources back into the databases, which I'll also show you here in a minute. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's when we said, okay, now we're ready to, to move in a deployed fashion against terrorism worldwide. So I had these 18 sites, and I proposed to go to them, and that was like nine and a half million dollars to do that. So in other words, Anything, if, if we had deployed that, we would planned on starting the deployment in January, and this was all done electronically, remotely downloaded, almost all. I mean, there were some sites we had to send the equipment, uh, but most of it was uh, electronic, electronic download, so we could do most of it in, in, within a week. Uh, and it uh, cost only $9.5 million, so we had to add some equipment here and there, so it would take a month to get there. But, you know, <clears throat> that would mean that we would know what the terrorists were doing as they did it because it was a focused, targeted approach. We didn't pull in meaningless data of people who weren't involved in anything. Uh, and so we had a very finite amount of information to look at, so it was a manageable problem. Um, and uh, in the end, we also put on that a, uh, because we, wanted, we didn't trust our own analysts, okay? <laughs> so uh, we built an audit routine in that to watch the entire network that we were building. So any analysts coming on, looking at data, we audited uh, as they did it. We, we looked at the network log and monitored exactly what they were doing. So they modified, or they, if they violated any law or any access or use of data, uh, we could pick that up as they did it. This was one of the things we uh, proposed for all of NSA, but they rejected that because it was, uh, we had two groups op opposing it. One were the analysts, that means they say, <clears throat> you mean to <clears throat> tell me you're going to be watching everything I do and monitoring me all the time and seeing how I manage data and all that? I said, sure. Uh, they, that, that whole group said, I don't want you monitoring you, me. or You just mind your own business. I'll do my job. You do yours. <laughs> uh, that kind of, uh, that's kind of a, a hypocritical statement, I thought. But at uh, any rate, uh, the other group were the managers, and they said, uh, you mean to tell me... Uh, You'll be able to see the programs that are succeeding, those that are failing? Uh, sure. And you'll be able to re give return on investment on all these programs? Certainly. I mean, we'll be able to manage all, see all the data coming in from the programs and, and see how productive it is and also see uh, the money being spent to maintain the program or to develop a program. So we'll be able to see all that. And he said, okay, and you mean to tell me you'll be able to see my, me moving money around to, and from one program to another? Yeah, we'll, we'll be able to see that too. And he said, you mean uh, these managers are saying, uh, and then uh, you mean to tell me that uh, you, Congress can come in and look at all this and see what's going on internally? They said, sure, they could do that. You are never going to do this program. So our proposal lasted one and a half months, okay? That was it. So, but it would have said that uh, Edward Snowden couldn't have taken any data without us knowing it. And we wouldn't have to guess at how much data he took. We'd know exactly what he took. So by refusing to do that back in 1991 and 92, they failed to see anybody doing uh, malicious stuff on the network, and they failed to see people taking data out. And so that, that's their state now. That's why they don't know what Edward Snowden took. 
It's uh, just a, uh, you know, it was a, a goofy way to do business. But uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, we were trying to protect and follow the law. It was constitutional. We wanted to take it to the courts to manage the whole process, give them the key to do de decrypt so they'd have to re request the decrypt from the courts. You know, all of that, make it, try to make it legal and it's consistent with the law and the Constitution that we had, and making sure that people had uh, their rights maintained and protected. Um, but uh, the first thing that the NSA did uh, once 9-11 uh, once happened, they took the, all the software we did and, and uh, removed all the filters in the front. So no longer were they filtering out people who weren't related to anything. They were taking in everybody, all the data. Every, everything on the fiber network. Um, and secondly, they removed all the encryption. That meant they knew exactly who was doing what with all the data. It was all right there. The metadata and the, and the names and labels for people, that was all right there for them to see and know who it was. So, and the final thing they removed was the audit routine because they didn't want to be tracked for who was doing what because this is all illegal and unconstitutional, and they don't want anybody to know how, who was doing it. So that was, the way, that was the way they hid it. It was all done in secret, and they had secret agreements from the lawyers, uh, Addington and you, at, uh, in the Department of Justice, and uh, Dick Cheney's lawyer, Addington. Uh, this was called, inside NSA, this whole program was called a, Dick, a Cheney blood oath. If you're familiar with Westerns, you know, they, yeah, the cowboys cut their hands, the Indians cut their hands, put them together, and now you're blood brothers. Well, that's what this, this was all about. It was, came out of Cheney's office. Uh, so, and by, his, by his comments, I refer to this as a Darth Cheney program because, uh, you know, he went to the dark side. At any rate, and he said that's what he said anyway, so I call him Darth Cheney. Anyhow, uh, so uh, this is how they, they, they corrupted it, and... Uh, that was early on in 2001, early in uh, September they started doing that. And so uh, the end result was that, uh, that they had so much data, and now they're taking in orders of magnitude more data, and building orders, you know, much larger storage facilities, like the one million square foot facility in, in Utah, uh, Fort, uh, I can't remember the Fort name, but it's uh, Bluffdale right outside of uh, Salt Lake City. And uh, that's a million square foot st facility. Now, they broke ground for a uh, new one last year and last summer on Fort Meade. It's 2.8 million square foot. It's almost three times the size. And uh, the reason is they, their objective is always keep collecting all the data, which is an ever-increasing amount year after year. That means, you know, you need to keep building bigger and bigger storage facilities. Because their, their philosophy is if you can't figure out what the data means, store it, and, and maybe some, some time down in a few more years you'll figure out an algorithm to go through to figure it out. Uh, so that's what they're doing, and that's how, they, that's how they're trying to keep up with this material. I mean, my, my estimate on, Fort, uh, on, the, on the Utah facility alone, that, uh, that it held about five zettabytes of data. Uh, that's a lot of repetition, no duplication, deleted or anything. So... But that's a lot of data. So, so, uh, uh, and uh, I, I, the estimate I based that on was Cisco, who said they sold who, they sold the routers to route data to that facility, and they estimated that the uh, from the size numbers and, and capacity of the routers that uh, that facility would be taking in 966 exabytes a year. That's about a zettabyte, so that should store at least five years. So, uh, my estimate was five zettabytes. Uh, and so that's, uh, but this is uh, what they're doing now in taking in bulk data. Uh, they're using it basically, the fiber network, and they're going around the world. Uh, they basically use three approaches, one looking at the corporations that run the fiber lines and they get the cooperation from them. That means they can move in and build the uh, facilities inside the, the co corporations with the fibers and tap the fibers and then pass them uh, to uh, to processors that handle the, corp the sessionizing of the data for the fiber operating network and for the tapping of the phone network, and then just take all that data and send it back to NSA. If the corporations don't agree, then they go to the, uh, to the governments uh, and have the governments approach their corporations and get cooperation through them. And if that doesn't work, uh, then they'll unilaterally tap. That means if they can access the fiber anywhere, underwater, underground, or wherever, They'll tap it, and nobody will know. That's what happened to uh, Google and, Ute and uh, Yahoo. NSA tapped the fiber lines between their data centers where they were backing up the data so that when they backed it up, they got every bit of data they had. 
right? It wasn't the simple little uh, part that they were trying to get from uh, uh, from a simple program like PRISM, which we'll get into in the next slide. This, these are the countries now that are participating. U.S. is first party. The other English-speaking countries here are second party. And then these are all the third parties. About nine of these countries are participating. I uh, only know a few of them, uh, Germany, Poland, uh, uh, Japan, uh, and uh, most likely Israel. Uh, so, and uh, probably about six others. They were outlined in the uh, Rampart A program. If you go on the Google, Google it on the web, you can start to read about the Rampart A program. They used our design who interface with other countries to do it. Thank you very much, you know. Uh, and so uh, this is the uh, what they call the prison program. This was everybody focused on this prison program. You know, these are the Facebook. All these people are the participants, and this was really a ruse. This is the idea here was to present a program that's actually conforming to the law, where they would give you a warrant and say we need data on this person, and then these companies would uh, comply and follow the warrant. So that, that they were presenting that to Congress and the and FISA court, and everybody saying we're following the law, when in fact. The real program is the upstream program. These are the fiber optic taps. This is where they're taking every bit of data off the network. And this is the Fairview program. That's AT&T, Stormbrews, uh, uh, Verizon, and uh, Blarney. Is about uh, 28 other country companies also uh, uh, tapping the fibers. And in Oakstar, the, the uh, uh, nine separate third-party countries that are participating also. So, but for example, uh, the Fairview program, these are the taps inside the United States. This is all unconstitutional. If you look at the, uh, uh, the green dots here, these are the transoceanic cables and where they surface. That's where all the foreigners are. And so yet they say the upstream programs are foreigners, yet all the other points are collecting domestic data. So the target there is domestic, not foreign. They want only foreigners there at the green dots where the, surface, where the cables surface, because that's where they all are. You know, either they're transiting coming into the US or going out to the US to foreigners, or transiting through the U.S. to, from Asia to Europe, or from South America. All the, it's no coincidence that the, uh, down here in Miami, <clears throat> all the cables from South America go up to Miami and then go back down to South America. That's so NSA gets a look at all the data in South America. At the, and they make the, the cables really cheap to rent, so that the bandwidth they, uh, they gets purchased by a lot of companies worldwide because it's cheap. Then, of course, they get to look at it. Uh, through the taps. So uh, that's the Fairview program, and the worldwide one carries all this. The real, the real, the real kicker here is the CNE. That's computer network exploitation. That means they're putting hardware and software in all the switches, servers, and routers around the world, so that they control them. So they own the network. So if any data passing through that is data they want, they route it also, dual route it to NSA. So and there's over. This was uh, this slide is old, but it's, it says there's over 50,000 of them here. Worldwide, so that's something. At that time, I don't have a date on this slide, but the, usually they put the first uh, first uh, classification redu review date, which is like 25 years after the initiation of the or the creation of the slide. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I don't have that here, so I can't tell you. But I think it's probably around 2010 this was going on. So they had about 50,000, greater than 50,000 taps in the network on in that at that time, and it's only gotten worse because their budget is between 10 and 15 billion dollars a year. And that's being spent just to collect this data and to store it, and and uh, they're not doing too well at analyzing it. Okay, that's why we have all these attacks that uh, they never stop. So, uh, here's the main fun, final, one well, of the ultimate objectives is they want to uh, map the entire internet, to any device, anywhere, and all the time. That means they want to know where you are every minute of the day, because you can map your devices to your to who you are and follow you wherever you are and wherever you go, whether you're at home and fixed, using fixed landlines or fixed computers or taking your computer and moving around or taking a mobile <laughs> phone or a satellite phone or any of it. This is there. You can read about this program. Google this on the web, and you can read about that if you want. Uh, these are then the, once you collect all this data, these are then the programs that they feed back into. This is. All of this area here is NSA, and you see over here is uh, FBI and CIA. Direct, this is the uh, FBI uh, Technology Center in Quantico. It's 
So they go through the Quantico Center, right directly into the database system. There is no oversight whatsoever of this approach. None of this is audited by or monitored by anybody. And it's shared with police around the world. And we'll get into that shortly. But uh, this is uh, the design of all the software that we had put in place and left them in 2001. Because once we found out what they were doing, collecting all this data, we couldn't stay there. That is, Kirk Weeby, Ed Lewis, and I, we had to leave NSA. We couldn't be associated with this. Because this is a direct violation of the Constitution, and it's a direct violation of any number of laws in the United States. Pen Register Law, the Electronic Privacy Act, Electronic Security Act, all the laws governing the FCC, regulations covering the, intelli the telecommunications companies. But that's also why the telecommunications companies had to get retroactive immunity for all the crimes they were committing in conjunction with the U.S. government. So, uh, you know, this, this, this was a really, uh, and we were partially responsible for this. This is why we're standing up and opposing it publicly, because this is a crime. And under Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7, which I keep pointing out to them, uh, it, they are, uh, by, by their own regulations, they cannot classify, maintain classified, or not declassify any evidence of a crime, corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse, all of which this is. So they are in violation of their own regulations for classification. And we've been waiting to argue this in court. So I've got four separate lawsuits running against the United States government for constitutional violations. This is what you have to do. I mean, I'm responsible for this, so I have to do something about it. That's my responsibility. I created this monster, and so I've got to stand up and do something. So I'm suing them. I've got four lawsuits running all on the constitutional basis, and they're scared as hell. They're trying to keep those out of, out of court as much as possible. That's one's in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, one's in the Third, one's in the Ninth, and one's in the Eleventh. These are the courts just below the Supreme Court. And that, well, that will mean I'm shining a lot of sunlight on their illegal, unconstitutional, criminal activity, and they don't want that. So, and this was the design. These are the drafting indexes here. Uh, and they index into the, the digital network database and the voice database. And when you pull the graphing routines out of here, you also pull the associated content with it so you can analyze all that by communities by simply making one pull. And it will pull all that data together. And that's unfortunately what we also left in the design. We didn't go any further than that because uh, and it was fortunate because we had to build the uh, visual displays and that, that, uh, <clears throat> that was taking a lot of time, so we didn't have time to do that. By that time, they started violating the Constitution. Of, uh, first, U.S. citizens were this first in the pit to get bulk acquisition. Now you've all joined us. Okay, we're all together uh, in this mess. Uh, so uh, all these programs are the ones we left them, and they haven't. I looked at all the publications from Edward Snowden, including the 2009 NSAIG report on the Stellar Wind program, which is the domestic collection part of that, and they haven't done anything to it. Nothing. So that's progress for you, right? At any rate, <clears throat> the further complication, this is where it gets really bad, okay? This, the problem here is when you give information on everybody to a central point and a, a central power, sooner or later they use it. And what they're doing here is this is the uh, uh, Special Operations Division, this sod here, of the Depart Direct, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration. It's also in conjunction with the FBI. They go into the NSA database, and, and the function of the sod is to analyze all the data in NSA for criminal activity, common crime, drug, drug, drug trafficking, you know, money laundering, anything they can find, they, they do it. The IRS is a part of this sod, too. So they look at the, for money laundering, tax evasion, that kind of thing. Uh, the others are DHS and CIA, and uh, uh, I think the uh, DIA is part of that. Uh, so the, there's a lot of government components who are also looking at this data with no oversight at all and no attempt at oversight. And then you see what they're saying here is, you know, uh, when you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't reveal or discuss it in, in any kind of reports or files or affidavits. You can't talk to the attorneys or, or even the court. You can't tell the judge you're using this data in the court. Um, you, you can't even tell the state and local officials who you tell to go arrest the people from the data. 
they say, go, go to this parking lot, watch for that truck to pull in that parking space, then go arrest them, bring in the drug dogs, and get the dope. And, uh, and, and you can't, of course, tell your foreign counterpart, well, that's your police. Right? That's anybody who has an, 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 any relationship with, uh, whatsoever with the FBI or the DEA worldwide, they can get this information. But they'll never be given the data to go into court. Uh, they'll just be told that you have to do what's called a parallel construction. Um, and this means um, you use standard policing techniques to find the data. Of course, it helps that you already know where it is from NSA, you know, so that makes it easier. And uh, <clears throat> that, uh, and, and you, uh, you can do the subpoenas and things like that. This is a standard policing approach to get data to, uh, to, uh, to arrest <coughs> people, to show probable cause and arrest them. Well, this is the data they used to substitute in the court of law for the data they really used, which was NSA collected data. So that's called perjury. I mean, that's simply perjury. And this is the Department of Justice of the United States doing it, as well as the other countries affiliated with them. So I call this a planned program perjury policy, I couldn't think of another P, uh, run by the Department of Justice of the United States. They're criminals. And so I call them the Department of Just Us. You know, because it ain't me and it ain't you. It ain't, it's not us, right? It's only a selected few. So at any rate, that's, that's really, the, uh, <clears throat> that's really the, the kicker here. This is now destroying our entire judicial uh, uh, process. Uh, I mean, it's a violation of the First Amendment, first from knowing you, you, you're not, you no longer have free association because of this. The, the Fourth Amendment, you no longer have privacy in terms of the content of your letters or email. That's a letter. Right? And the Fifth Amendment, you're testifying yourself against yourself because they're reading everything you're saying. Now that's a violation of the Sixth Amendment's due process. Once they do that, they, they fabricate evidence to substitute in the court of law, which denies you due process. You have the right to challenge discovery in the court of law, which says you have the right to challenge anything they have and, as evidence and use against you. Well, they're fabricating it. You can't, and I mean, how are you going to challenge that? So it's a total violation of the Constitution. That I call this treason against the, the, the founding principles of the United States. And it's subverting... The con your, your constitutional rights, your civil rights, all over the world, because this data is being used against people here in Europe. And we have help from our European allies. Thank you. That's the ethical problem here, and we started this. We are responsible for some of this, and we have to speak against it. That's the point I have. Thanks. Guest lecturing with Bill Binney in Cambridge. It's like, you know, next level growth is unlocked. It's amazing. Um, my name is Aaron Gompas. My corporate title is Lead Advisor Information Security for a big Dutch uh, engineering advisory company called Brunel, named after the British guy. Um, it was lead hacker or anything with the word hacker was not allowed in the legal department, so it became this thing. Um, and I get to work with Bill on some very thorny big data problems where we have to do analytics on big data, but then also the data that is collected and processed need to be secured and needs to be brought into compliance with uh, European privacy laws. So that's sort of my job, to engineer the IT under some of his and some of our other brilliant data science people to make sure that we can actually IT engineer some systems underneath that stuff to make it a technical reality. Um, so, there, so yeah, I get to have people like Bill's colleague. We also sponsor a boat, so when it's not sailing around the world at ridiculous speeds, we very occasionally get to play with this under adult supervision, which is very cool. Uh, this thing actually sails 10% faster than the wind speed, which can go up to crazy speeds. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's the biggest piece of carbon fiber I ever got my hands on. Um, so one of the problems with digital security and, and losing information or getting uh, what is called cyber crimes, the word cyber is difficult because it doesn't really mean anything, but it sounds very cool to managers, so it's abused a lot. Um, is that it's very hard to know where stuff comes from. Much harder than in the physical world. If your car gets stolen, 
you have a starting point that the last time you saw your car, that's probably where the thief was at some point when they stole it. Um, if somebody is going into your computer and making off with money of your bank account, they could be anywhere in the world. And it can be quite difficult, especially for police organizations that are not, shall we say, well-versed in some of this interweb stuff, um, to, to help you out get your money back. And usually it's, um, it's difficult. The attribution problem also goes to bigger situations when you're not talking about small theft of a you know, couple of hundred euros or a couple of thousand pounds, but on like, digital attacks from entire countries. Well, who is doing the attacking? Which, if you're making all kinds of plans to counterattack, it's you know if you're going to hack back, as some um, legal uh, frameworks are now uh, making possible in Europe, it's hard. You know, it's, it's important that you counterhack the right country, right? So if you think, oh, the Russians did it, you're going to counterhack Russia, a country that has a sort of sordid history of being attacked by Western countries and with nuclear weapons, and it turns out it wasn't Russia but somebody else, and this could get you know very thorny. Um, so, you know, was it the Russians or was it the Sharks? This is important to know the difference, because otherwise we get into real problems. So, thanks to Bill and Edward Snowden and, and Tom Drake and other brave people, um, we know now that the spying is actually way beyond some of, you know, the worst nightmares of the hacker scene in the 1990s. You know, all the stuff you saw in, um, you know, movies from the 90s now seems rather quaint and modest and, you know, childish almost knowing what we now know, how bad things really are. Um, so when the NSA says our mission is to know everything, that's not some sort of abstract theoretical concept. When they say everything, they're talking down to the bit, globally, ideally in real time. Right? So for those not well versed in German, um, the girl asks, my daddy says, you can look into my computer, and Obama answers, that's not your daddy. In the summer of 2013, <laughs> Uh, Obama visited Berlin two weeks after Ed Snowden went public, because that trip had already been planned six months ahead, and American people had arrived in Berlin to weld shovel the manhole covers, and as they do when they come to town. Um, and so they, would, they didn't want to cancel the, uh, the visit, because that would be you know, giving in to Snowden, so that wasn't possible. Of course, the Germans have some history with various flavors of totalitarian, totalitarian governments. They've tried both major flavors and found them wanting, shall we say. Um, so they were not amused. So Obama's popularity drop prayer was kind of massive, and not a lot of people went, came to watch him do another little Kennedy moment in front of where the wall used to be. Um, so why do we do all the spying? Well, as Bill can attest, it's not to catch terrorists, because you know the number of terrorists being caught by the NSA in this century proudly stands stable at zero, which is about the same number as most of, you know, all the airport security and all that, you know, uh, uh, stuff. Um, never caught a single terrorist. Certainly got two through, to my knowledge, so it's a failure rate of 100% up to so far, globally. Um, so it's not about catching terrorists. It's not even necessarily about national security in the strict sense of the word. It's about national security in the broadest economic sense of the word. It's about political and industrial <coughs> espionage. It's about messing about with climate negotiations because your delegation, the American delegation, has NSA supplied dossiers on all the other delegates that are coming to talk with them. And if you need to negotiate about something with somebody, and you know everything about them, and I mean everything, what they had for breakfast, who they had a fair way, when they smoked a joint, when it was the first time they smoked a joint, when it was the last time they smoked a joint, and how many in between, and all that, and who else was in the room when they smoked it, that makes negotiation a lot easier because everybody has something to hide. And if you say you don't, then please come up to the stage and I'll interview you over your sex life from age 11 upwards. We'll post it on YouTube and then you know, we'll continue the discussion. No takers? Okay, so we're all clear on this, right? Then, fine, good. So yeah, industrial espionage, why do we do it? Because it works. Because it's great. If somebody has spent billions on researching something, you just grab it. And you know, that's, yeah, that's easy. You're not as good as making all the discoveries yourself because you're going to miss some knowledge, but hey, you just save yourself billions. So everybody does that, but none probably more than the United States right now because we buy all the technology. So we buy their incredible <coughs> stuff and place it in our organizations, in our homes, in our bedrooms, in our parliaments, in our hospitals. It's everywhere. Um, so this is just some of the sort of horror show on top of all the stuff that. Bill just talked about. Um, so, one more uh, NSA internal slide. 
it's crazy that an organization with their budget, the size of a small country, cannot have better graphics than this. But it's <laughs> um, and so they are very proud about the fact that the 80 major global technology corporations, these are all American, of course, have partnerships with them. They call it partnerships. I would use another word, but this is being recorded, and so I don't want to you know, do any unparliamentary language. But yeah, um, so all this stuff is backdoored, broken, insecure by design. It is that way when it comes out of the box and there's very little you can do about it. Intel chips have backdoors, Microsoft operating systems have backdoors, IBM mainframes, all, all this stuff. And if you switch this off in most Western countries, you're basically switching off the country. Now, it's not just the fact that now you can no longer watch cats on YouTube, which in itself is a small disaster. Also, the supermarket that you get your food from is going to be running out of fresh produce, probably even about 36 hours. And if you take a big city like London and it runs out of food, people are going to start acting very, very irresponsibly in a very fast manner. And the police force is not going to be able to handle that. So this is a pretty bad situation. It was already bad before we had an impulse control individual in the White House. I think now maybe things are getting even worse. Um, <coughs> So not content with just you know having most of the planet under a kill switch that they can execute at any time, uh, somebody in the U.S. thought it was a good idea to go on for full cyber war in the context without even declaring war. So America, with a little bit of help from Israel that they didn't really appreciate or want, uh, it was more of an accident, created the Stuxnet virus against the non-military nuclear installation in Natanz in Iraq, uh, a country at the time where the CIA's uh, opinion on it was that they did not have a nuclear weapons program, and that the installation in the towns was actually a legal civilian program. So not just me and a bunch of other people saying that is actually the national intelligence estimate on Iran out of 2007. Uh, but yeah, it had to be destroyed anyway, so they built a virus that took on the industrial controlling equipment sitting in between the computers running the factory and the actual centrifuges spinning very fast, being filled with uranium hexafluoride gas. Um, of course, the virus escaped into the wild, as viruses do, because they replicate. So it ended up breaking lots of other stuff. And then, of course, people figured it out. People got copies of the virus, and it was reverse engineered, and people studied it, and we traced it back. And so this is how we know all this stuff. Of course, a copy of the virus is now available at archive.org. So if you have ambitions to take down some big chunk of industrial real estate somewhere, go to archive.org, download the virus, you know, do some programming, and have some fun. Um, so, Iran, of course, not very amused about the fact that one of their prime pieces of industrial real estate was being messed up by some foreign entity. So, they formed their own little group of doing comparable things with comparable skill sets and took down all 33,000 computers of Saudi Aramco and wiped them clean down to the BIOS level in a single night. Basically, a way of saying to America, hey, you want to play? We can do this. And then everybody stepped back from the brink and started behaving slightly more responsibly, thank God. Um, so, 40 years ago, this was top secret. Now it's on Wikipedia. That is how technology develops. So, initially only one country had the bomb, then two, then four. Today, probably 30 or 40 countries could manufacture nuclear weapons if they had that desire. Technology <coughs> democratizes. In the end, everybody has it. Now, with nuclear weapons, this is a very slow and painful process and we have some measure of control over it, although maybe not as much as we'd like. With digital weaponry, the time frames are much more compressed and of course the threshold to get into it is much, much lower. And so this is a problem. So this is a world map of internet connected industrial control systems and it sort of tells you why doing this cyber war stuff is an incredibly bad idea for the West. Because it's not a question of if we're going to lose the cyber war, it's just, is it going to be in the first five minutes or the first 30 minutes? It's going to be a really, really, really messy. And we really shouldn't be antagonizing other countries into developing weapons capability of the kind of weapons that we are most vulnerable for. It is a truly, truly silly and destructive policy. Um, of course, building <coughs> digital weapons and then leaving them around on the internet is just a really, really bad idea. But it happened, so... Last year in the summer, we got a whole um, uh, Cisco attack toolkit that became available online, and many of my colleagues spent quite a few weekends fixing up a very large number of Cisco networking equipment to just you know, keep from networks going and stuff like that. Um, so it could have been a lot worse. It wasn't. Um, 
Now, of course, we've seen the WannaCry virus this year and the Petcha virus, which in this country took, about, took down about 40 hospitals. In the Netherlands, it took down 17 container, uh, container terminals at the cost of about 350 million euros. And it took several weeks for global logistics change to recover from that, since Rotterdam is the world's biggest port. Um, so that's bad. That was not, I contend, a criminal activity. The total revenue from this whole thing was less than $100,000. So it was a criminal action, it was a total failure. And so I don't think it was a criminal action. I think the criminal stuff was just a thin layer of veneer to hide what was actually going on there. And what was actually going on there is somebody found a bunch of cyber weapons online and was testing them. Because if you have a weapon, you have to test it. Now if you're the NSA, and your year budget is the size of a medium-sized country, then you can replicate you know, a chunk of the internet in-house air gap from the rest of the planet, and that's where you test your stuff. But say you are a very small country, or maybe you're not even a country, you're a, a company, or a terrorist group, or, I don't know, a bunch of bored Pakistani students. You know, it could be anybody. And you have found a weapon, and you know, play with it a bit, and so where do, you, where do you test it? Well, you test it on the internet. And then somebody else calls it the one cry virus when it takes down 40 UK hospitals. And, you know, you probably learned something from that test. We don't know who learned and what they learned, but somebody learned something. It was interesting. It was sort of like this, you know, little nuclear physics experiment. It was supposed to be a six megaton blast, but we didn't really understand lithium-6 isotopes very well at the time, so it turned into a 15 megaton blast, which for the people in the forward observation bunker was not a lot of fun. Um, also for the people in the Japanese fishing boat, a very bad day. So all this stuff, of course, sounds like a really, really bad movie, but it turns out to be just factually true. And yes, particularly Edward Snowden gave us very detailed technical documentation on all of this stuff. So the debate is no longer, is this true, is it happening? The only real debate we should be having is what we're going to do about it. So, this being the UK, you have to go there. Um, Ed Snowden also told us another thing. He told us that a lot of stuff is broken. <clears throat> But he also told us that there's some things that do work. So our governments, including the government in this country, after every terrorist attack, keep saying we have to ban crypto now, even though there is not a single case in you know, recent European history where crypto plays a significant role in the preparation of crypto attacks. So if you want to prevent the recent terrorist attacks, what you need to do is you need to ban the rental of white vans to young men not installing signal on your phone or using PEP, because those things play no role, right? So are our governments stupid, or is there something else going on? I'll leave this as a question for the audience. But so, encryption can work if you use it correctly, and of course, if you have the hardware that can be made safe. Um, so that is uh, something you can, uh, you can do. There we go. So one of the things I do with some of my colleagues as we look at the IT infrastructures of very large organizations are basically two things that we do. One is we try to measure the stuff that's already there and we try to uh, secure it as well as possible. But I think WannaCry and Petya virus are literally just a tiny tip of the iceberg of the crap that we're going to see over the next few years. And so our ability to secure that environment is going to go down in the future and there's very little we can actually do about it. <coughs> Nothing to do with the fact how clever we are or may not be, it's just that all these systems are broken and the secrets about that brokenness is now out there. So everybody's going to get in on this game, and it's going to be a pretty big uh, mess. So while we're doing that, we have the parallel program, which is we're going to be architecting new stacks that are not dependent on all the stacks that we now know that are broken, because why would you continue to use technology that you know is completely hopelessly insecure? And not just insecure, it's insecurable by design. <coughs> so we have to move away from that. Now, that is not something you can do quickly. It's a multi-year process. I think, you know, between five to 10 years, an organization, depending on how big you are and how much money you want to spend on it, stuff like that. Um, but I know for sure that in about eight or 10 years, you can develop and implement a completely new, from the silicon up IT architecture. New chip architectures, new operating system layers, new middleware, new applications, and new interfaces. And also in that time period, people can learn how to use those. And now, why is it that I know that for absolute certain? Well, because we did it for the last 10 years. Completely new sort of system. It was implemented in our society. We didn't have to put everybody in a new school. Everybody adopted it. Everybody can use it. And this is a computer. And it works. So we can do it. It's a matter of, do you want to do it? Do you give it priority? And do you have some policy framework to do it? So these are some of the things that we sort of buy or build 
uh, or architect for some of the clients that really have high sort of security needs. So your basic you know, laptop or whatever device comes with some security features, but really it's not very much. So we can put some uh, more secure operating system on there and apps and some crypto stuff, and then we can harden the hardware, and then we can even replace things like the BIOS with something that we can actually audit and trust. And then, of course, there's custom hardware all the way at the top. The problem with that is, if you're, say, a journalist, we do a lot of work with investigative journalists, then you don't want to be caught with custom hardware at the Iranian border after you've done just done an interview with the political opposition there. And this is probably going to end bad for you or and your sources. <coughs> so this is usually also expensive. <coughs> this other stuff is not that expensive. It mostly requires a bit of knowledge and a bit of time. Um, of course, if you're going to do some of the more scary stuff in the world, uh, visiting uh, dangerous countries or whatever, you also need to learn other things about security, not just you know the crypto stuff, not just the math. You also have to not leave your laptop lying around in your hotel in a country where the government probably already has their eye on you. You know, I can't help you if you leave your laptop lying around in a hotel that other people can enter and put a, a hardware bug under your keyboard that records all your keystroke, including your password, so then everything falls apart. So, yeah, we train people into this stuff. And it's remarkable how fast you can teach people, you know, some basic security stuff. A couple of days if they're motivated to learn this. So this stuff helps against mass surveillance. I would suggest that everybody should be using that as a bare minimum. And then, you know, well, how far do you want to go? It's, do, are you doing something important? Might you be messed with by somebody? Maybe you're making life difficult for a big company or something like that. Or you have a... You have a brilliant idea for a new startup and you want to keep it a secret from a potential competitor, you might want to go a bit further there. Um, so this is all very, very doable. Now, I'm a big proponent of using free software because we can audit it for the same reasons that I think we should be able to read our laws. I think we should also be allowed to read the code that runs our lives. Not because everybody's going to be reading that code. I tend not to read source code. It's mostly beyond me. I do other stuff. Um, but I do think it's important that we live in a society where I have the right to read the code that I'm found. In the same way that I'm not a lawyer and not don't read law books all the time, but I would be a bit worried if I wasn't allowed to read the law because it interfered with somebody's ability to make money. I don't think that is a good priority setting. So I think free software is key to having at least a chance of creating systems that we can trust. It's not a guarantee. The same as democracy is not a guarantee of having a nice country, but it does seem to be sort of a precondition for it, right? So it's not, you know, immediately um, instant unicorns, uh, but it's sort of an important step towards there, I think. So if you're going to be building systems or part of a group that architects something, I think a very good general rule for dealing with data, especially data about human beings, that if you can't protect it, don't collect it. Very, very simple. Don't collect more than you need. And if you're unsure if you can protect this stuff, don't do it. Which is one of the big problems with mass surveillance, aside from the fact that it's probably illegal, probably immoral, and it doesn't work. You're creating a giant new pile of data, which is now, of course, obviously a new target for all kinds of other people who want to say, hey, would you like me a copy of that? And then can you secure it? Maybe not. You know, the NSA couldn't secure their internal above top secret documents from an external contractor who was basically hired to manage a bunch of SharePoint servers. True story. It's called Edward Snow. So, yeah, professional responsibility. Um, it's really simple. You have to take it. Some of you guys will be developing concepts, ideas, algorithms, formulas, maybe source code that's going to do important stuff. And so it's not enough to say, oh, I'm just you know doing an algorithm here. I'm, I'm not sure what it's going to be used for. You know, it might be running some source code in a drone that flies over Pakistan and shoots at kids. But hey, you know, I just wrote the algorithm. It's not my responsibility. No, that's not good enough. We all have to get there because there's lots of other people who understand the mathematics and the source code and the security <coughs> a lot less than anybody in this room. And they make decisions that are sometimes quite insane. And anybody who's read the news of the last decade can, I think, think of a couple of examples. So, yeah, all of us as professionals and as human beings need to take responsibility for the stuff that we help create. Because otherwise, you know, we end up with a lot more bad stuff. So we'd like technology and science to do a wonderful thing for us. But powerful tools can be used in two ways. And so we need to take responsibility. So I wrote this book back in 2014 to help journalists. It's called... It's the internet, we're all journalists now. So if you just want to get some basic tricks on, you know, how to do this stuff, then this is written for non-technical people. So I think that most of you should be able to 
get through it in a few hours. Um, and it just tells you now how to set up your laptop with some basic tools. And if you want to go a bit more paranoid, there's some tips in there as well. So it's a free download. Um, the entire text is, of course, a Creative Commons license. So if you want to take a bit of data and reuse it to explain you know, to your local school 12-year-olds, then please do so. Make a version for 12-year-olds if you want to do that. Don't ask my permission. Just go do it um, and go fix some problems. So that's me. And I think uh, Bill and me are going to be here uh, for a bit. So questions? Um, either now or later when we're having pizza. And thank you all for your attention. Right, so we have some time for questions for both Bill and I. So I guess I can pull around two more seats and then we can sit and make it feel a bit more relaxed. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll try to just ask one or two. Um, for William Mouse, um, before, at, at least before the Bush government started removing your safeguards, um, how were dual citizens treated? Citizens, because I understand there was an attempt to focus on foreign nationals. But they were treated as U.S. citizens. Okay. And when they went to mass collection, they were collected too. And um, <coughs> um, I've used your CIJ guys to help train uh, mm -hmm. UN charities. Um, thank you very much for writing it. Right. Um, you mentioned the Intel Management Engine, and you talked earlier about freeing the bios. Yep. Um, I was wondering, maybe for both of you, whether you William, you might be aware of whether the NSA was or, or has more recently been successfully uh, exfiltrating data via the management engine. Uh, I don't know about that specifically, uh, <clears throat> but they, they've been exfiltrating uh, data for a very long time using many different methods. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> some of the close-in methods, uh, if you uh, looked at the 30C3 uh, talk that jo Jacob Applebaum gave, he pulled out a lot of data from Snowden's material to, to show a lot of the uh, close-in access stuff. I've seen that talk, but I don't think it covered the... Uh... It, 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 looked, I did. It, it mentioned the Intel end. So we now have some methods <clears throat> on certain specific hardware platforms to disable it. That appears to work. Still testing some of this stuff. Um, Previously, there was a you know a specific model of ThinkPad X60, which haven't been made since 2009, and we're running <coughs> out of them. They're becoming sort of heirloom laptops now that you have to inherit from your grandparents. And careful, wipe them with a cloth. Um, but we're getting more and more laptop models now that are commodity available, where we can disable this engine and then combine it with hardened operating systems and removing <coughs> key components out of the laptop, such as you know Bluetooth chips and Wi-Fi and speakers and microphones and infrared eyes and hot gluing these and a port and a bunch of things, then you know you can have a reasonably hardened laptop for a commodity cost level. I wouldn't say hack proof because I don't know everything the NSA has, because some of the stuff they have is sorta of, kinda of out of Star Trek. Um, but you can make it a lot harder than with the ordinary uh, no, no, I mean, seriously, some of the documents I read, especially in that 33 T talk by Jack Applebaum, that really is Star Trek y sounding like. You know, looking at somebody's screen from 15 kilometers away by bouncing microwave radiation off the laptop. That was operational back in 2008 in Afghanistan. It's not a fantasy, that's technical <coughs> reality and has been for almost a decade. It's not shared with us, mostly. Um, but so we are moving forward, I think, to creating more secure devices. Luckily, we already have a bunch of software stacks that are not perfect, but that are pretty good. So combining those with, you know, CPU architectures that we can control and BIOS architectures that we can control, I think we have a, a chance to create affordable systems that non-technical people can use with a little bit of training that are significantly hard to get into so you can't keep a secret. And we see with, you know, certain high-end sort of investigative journalists but also with organizations like WikiLeaks that despite an extreme regime of surveillance directed against them, often individually with massive resources, they still are able to maintain secrets. So there is sort of a forward path, but we're not really investing the resources in it right now that we should. Um, so, I, But I think there is a solution there. Yes. All right, so 
you're talking about you know, journalists and securing their sort of their, their hardware and their software. But one of the things that WannaCry revealed this year, and I mean, that of course is a Microsoft backdoor, and everyone is used, most people use Windows computers. And if they don't have a personal Windows computer, then they're using a Windows computer generally at work or in the university yep. or you know, in the hospitals and the stores, etc. So, how, I mean, that, that for me is a bigger picture because you can't just go and replace everybody's Windows computers and now get people to adopt a new system or new custom hardware or new custom software. So going forward, I mean, how do you actually get into a situation where the entire world is using more secure operating systems because, quite frankly, because of how proprietary software works, we're all pretty much, and when I say we, not just people, but organizations, are addicted to these proprietary software, Windows, yes. hardware, Intel chips, etc. We can't get out of that ecosystem. Well, no, you can. You have to make it a priority. I, I just you have I thought, to make it a priority. I think one thing that, that, that we can do is to choose to go and work for companies that produce open source operating systems, auditable operating systems, rather than choosing to work for companies that produce these closed operating systems that can't be scrutinized. You, know, you can choose to work for Microsoft and get paid a lot of money. You can choose to work some, for something like... Uh, uh, the Linux project, and you get paid a lot less money, or Debian, but you're doing something a bit more substantial. Yeah. And as the individuals, we have to decide, you know, how much money do I want to make versus how much, not that simple, but you know, how much money do I want to make versus how much am I concerned about the products that I'm making? Am I propagating this ecosystem of, you know, unsafe software, unsafe computing versus am I going to devote myself, or at least part of myself, to providing something that is more safe, more secure? And as an indeed, so everything you're saying about proprietary software is true. It's also a policy choice. 30 years ago, everybody was using asbestos because it had wonderful <laughs> positive properties such as fire retarding and yeah. insulation and, you know, beautiful stuff, really asbestos. <clears throat> now we should be building all children's hospitals out of solid asbestos, clearly, because, you know, think of the children and the possible fire. Then it turns out it's asbestos had this one property that, while having no building technical factor, was a bit of a thing and gave you cancer. So then we stopped using asbestos. And it took about 20 years of fighting with the building industry to convince them to stop using materials that gave us cancer. So I think the tragedy here is that, you know, we've known about some of these problems actually, yeah. especially things like the fact that all Windows operating systems, to take an example, are by design backdoored mm. and have been since at least 1999 that we know of, probably before that, and we knew this, you know, in a, in a report to the EU Parliament back in 2001, um, July 2001, and then everybody went on holiday, and then in September they were going to debate it, and something else happened. Um, so we sort of forgot about it. We could have charted, started transitioning in the early 2000s. So when I say it takes 10 years, it always takes 10 years. So every day you <coughs> wait, you know, we're starting the transition. It's going to be one more day that 10 years later you're not yet done yet. Had we started in 2005 or 2007, we would have been done by now, mostly. And Europe would have saved itself, I don't know, something like a trillion or two trillion euros in license fees, plus a humongous amount of cost of management and risks and security and cybercrime and all this you know, suffering. It is weird to me that educational systems mandate an operating system produced by a multiple convicted economic criminal as a good solution, which is also the single most vulnerable platform on the planet. Why do you do that? Well, I think to compound that as well is that in the United States, the, they, they, you know, every school is sort of, they're rolling out laptops to schools and their preferred vendors are Google for the Chromebooks and Microsoft. And both of those, you know, are known to have backdoors to the NSA. Yeah. And that's what kids or, you know, children under the age of 18, so minors, are using, and there's, that's happening recently, so there doesn't seem to be any deceleration in that trend. This is, this is true. So, well, I don't think, you know, we should bother too much before our <laughs> friends in the colonies are doing, because they're doing all kinds of crazy shit, like not having health care and giving <laughs> AR-15s to mentally deranged yeah. people. So, we, I don't think we should can't take them as a standard. I think that's just a silly thing to do. So, I think we should have our own thing. You know, we have a very large group of smart countries here, and we're perfectly capable of developing this stuff ourselves. Why are we paying in Europe about 250 billion euros a year for yeah. spyware? Mm. And we could be using 250 billion euros a year to develop technology that we own. It's just a really, really silly thing. 
And so you can say, it has always been dust. Well, you know, it used to be that slavery was always been dust. At some point, you have to start changing. And then lots of people will say, oh, this is economically terrible. Think of all those cotton plantations. Well, in the end, we change it. So do you want to be part of the change, or do you want to be part of the people that say that, well, slavery may not be good, but you know, it's an economic necessity? What camp do you want to be in? Yes. On Microsoft Research around the world, um, I, I will not comment on, on Windows, um, but I want to point out that um, we work on an open source research project where we, we implement in the, the TLS stack. And uh, it's all open source. The goal is to, to verify it. And um, yeah, so I, I saw a nice connection to your mountain of mm -hmm. um, building a new, <coughs> um, a new software stack. Maybe you can see a bit more on, on, on your work and I can talk afterwards. About that. Okay, cool. Yeah. We, we have a chance to, to, to talk with, with Bill and Ayan afterwards. We're going upstairs for pizza if anyone wants to, to, to join. Cool. Okay, more questions? Um, I'd like to go back to Mr. Vinny. When you were, I mean, let, let's go back to the beginning of the story. When you were at the NSA, yeah. <clears throat> you and half a gazillion others were developing this software. Six other people. Six. 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 Uh, six. 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 All of this came out before you, you found that the NSA was misusing it. When you were in the process of development and you were talking to managers and your colleagues and so on, how much ethical discussion was there inside the NSA before the excrement hit the fan? Uh, uh, <clears throat> none, because I never talked to the managers. The reason I didn't was because uh, <clears throat> if I talked to them, they'd, they'd want to Im impede my progress. So I never, I never asked permission. I simply did it. That's the way I operated inside NSA. That was another reason they didn't like me, because I didn't subject myself to their opinions and convoluted logic. Uh, because they were more, their agendas was more like building an empire, maintaining the empire they have, <clears throat> acquiring more money, building a budget. That was not mine. Mine was solving the problem. Just to follow on that. How far into to developing this, so FinFit was the main program you developed, how far into that did you realize, uh, uh-oh, this could be causing a big problem in and of itself? Uh, <clears throat> well, basically, when the graphing technique we had, we were graphing about, in the one system we were graphing a little over 10 trillion transactions. And it was boiling down to something like 200 billion relationships. Uh, which made me, you know, uh, at the media, at that point you knew you were into everything in the world and you had, you were into everybody's knickers. So you had to, that was very, well, at that point we said, <clears throat> this is the most powerful analytic process ever developed for, by man. So we've got to do something to protect people in this process. And that was probably, uh, <clears throat> uh, we first started seeing the output of that in 1998. By, by late 98, uh, we were say, saying this. Right. So it was only a few months after we started. Yes. Uh, another question. <coughs> uh, the other day I saw a movie, uh, I'm not sure, I had, but uh, based on your story, and at the end of the um, movie, the guy who do the whistleblowing and the move to uh, Russia, and uh, his program, <coughs> and, uh, and I wonder if you have seen that movie. Edward Snowden, yeah. Yeah, so... I helped, uh, I was the technical coordinator for that, for Edward, uh, Oliver Stone. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, that is the real story, and uh, so I believe some part of yours uh, also put in that story. Because yes. I saw that uh, hey, uh, that picture, you saw the indexing, I was remembering that movie very, very many. That's where it came from. <laughs> it came from. <laughs> yeah, I was providing all the technical background for that movie. Thank you. Mm. Uh, uh, yes. <clears throat> So you talked about uh, the bulk collection of data, this is like a huge amount of data that has been collected, but my impression is that most of this data would be encrypted, right? And... Um... Yeah, no, see, that's the thing they removed. They removed the encryption. So it's not encrypted at all. Uh, you mean the collected data? Yeah, but <clears throat> they have ways of seeing through a good deal of that. But, yeah, but... Okay, because my, I mean, more and more we're seeing like end-to-end -end encrypted chat and end-to-end -end encrypted applications, and so I'm assuming that 
what they call, I, I don't know what... Uh, but running on completely broken platforms and completely broken hardware platforms. Right, that, that's, that's my point is, so, so if they want to compromise endpoints, they can. But yep. what percentage of all our endpoints, our phones, our computers are being actively targeted? Is it, is it a few thousand people, a few million people? Is it all of us that they're actively like decrypting all our end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted chats? Uh, well, they have a couple hundred people working on that, I think. Uh, <clears throat> that's my guess at it, okay. It's being done in uh, S3.1. If you go look at the uh, uh, <clears throat> NSA organizational chart, you can see where it fits. It's the, uh, de de the encryption. I think they've divided into uh, uh, Suite A and Suite B encryption systems. Uh, I think <clears throat> the fundamental difference is that uh, the open source is in uh, Suite B, um, and the uh, uh, governmental, military kinds of things are in uh, Suite A. That's where the um, key exchange never occurs in an open form. It's always uh, couriered, and the key changes every day for every device on every link. So um, in that sense, it's much more difficult to, to attack than uh, a generic uh, encryption system used by many people. Again, just to follow up on that, it's not that they can't decrypt things that are end-to-end -end encrypted, even if they don't have yeah. VPNs compromised. They <coughs> did that a few years ago, and again, we learned that from, from Snowden, yeah. if you want to expand right. on this, that, 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 that Diffie Hellman Key Exchange was, was an implementation that was compromised, and they're able to read one-third of encrypted internet traffic. So that's end-to-end -end encrypted communication was still able to be decrypted without any compromise on the actual endpoints. Just grab the encrypted data, they're yeah. able to open it. Also, the, the process of targeting individual systems used to be a highly manual process, which means it now didn't scale. Yeah. Now it is highly automated. So you can yep. automatically compromise millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of endpoints because there's no individual human involved in going after that one laptop or mobile phone. And so mass surveillance or targeted surveillance now scale, scales to mass. So what we now have is massively scaled targeted surveillance, which is literally the worst of both worlds. Yes. I assume other countries have programs like the NSA. And I was wondering whether they sort of tap it and then the other country also taps it, or whether the NSA competes and was wants to prevent other countries from tapping. Uh, well, I mean, other countries do uh, <clears throat> do the <clears throat> this type of activity to the to the resource with the ability they've got in terms of resources and and access and things like that, and whether or not other countries are buying their equipment, you know, giving them access into it, their system. So, uh, the U.S. by far is the largest uh, seller of equipment worldwide. <laughs> the Chinese are trying to compete now. Compete now. So, <clears throat> you know, if you buy anything that's not yours, made in your country, you're buying somebody else's tap point. So, 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 what, uh, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> I think the answer is they try to do as much as they can, but they, they, the resources they have isn't anywhere near what the NSA or GCHQ have. There's also a reasonable, yeah. a reasonable assumption that so there's <clears throat> 70,000 or 80,000 contractors at NSA at the time of Snowden. So do we think the Snowden was the only one who ever took <clears throat> something? Or do we think maybe there's 10 or 20 Chinese infiltrators in there? What would you do if you were Chinese intelligence? <clears throat> are you going to build your own trillion dollar intelligence apparatus? Or are you going to just infiltrate 20 people as commercial contractors who <clears throat> make about $200,000 a year? So it's not a shitty job. Into the <clears throat> NSA and just get the keys to the kingdom that way. It's much easier, cheaper, and you don't have to do all yeah. that stuff yourself. So <clears throat> basically assume that anything the NSA collects, they can protect from tens of dozens of, maybe thousands of other people who go in there <clears throat> and who then just also take it. And again, it's not limited to Chinese intelligence. It might also be a Mexican drugs cartel because they have <coughs> intelligence needs. So it's a giant unlimited grab bag for everybody and anybody. That's the problem. You know, if it was just one organization, it would be bad, but at least there was some <coughs> sort of control somewhere. But since they can't control their own stuff that they collect, we should assume that lots of entities have it and not just governments. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Two very interesting talks about measures that one can take to protect against infiltration by agencies. But that leads on to a question. And in asking the question, I'm not saying that I approve of what it's about. But 
what's your views on the proposition that security agencies, military intelligence agencies, <coughs> have an internally attributed authority to evade the law? In that, for instance, if <coughs> they want to burgle somebody, they can do it. If they think it's necessary to assassinate somebody, they can do it. All you need is authorization at a sufficiently high level, and it does happen. So what's your views? Well, <coughs> I, I, I think that they basically do exactly what you say. I mean, they, but they don't they do it in secret now. They're doing it out in the open, <coughs> right? Like, for example, Clapper lies to Congress about what they're doing. And they find out about it. What happens to him? Nothing, right? Uh, they, you know, other people lie to Congress, Alexander, and nothing happens, right? They release the phone conversations of the U.S. president. What happens to them after that? Nothing. This is the arrogance of power of the shadow government, which I call the uh, <clears throat> the and the intelligence agencies are the Praetorian Guard of the U.S. <coughs> they determine who the emperor is and what they do, and they're arrogant about it and open about it. Now, I mean, it's more recent, the last four or so years, they're being open and just saying, we can do anything we want. If, if those agencies have <clears throat> a proud and documented history of, you know, fighting for truth, democracy, and apple pie and stuff like that, maybe then we could accept that sometimes in order to stop <clears throat> something terrible from happening, they have to break <clears throat> laws that other people have to uphold. Instead, of course, they have a very proud history of going after politicians, environmental activists, journalists, and so forth and so forth, toppling democratic governments. I mean, the list is endless, right? Just go Google Operation Ajax for some of the answers So it sort of splits two ways. If it's for the good of national protection as such, it's, could be okay. it, it could be maybe acceptable yeah. with the proper <coughs> oversight. Uh, if it is for the suppression of opinion. Or if it is to topple other governments to make them safe for American food companies to build plantations. <laughs> or, you know, there's people there who have elected <coughs> the wrong leader and we want their oil because obviously it's our oil under their sand, as we all know. Yeah, we use it for freedom, so it must be ours. <laughs> then, then this has nothing to do with <coughs> national security. The term, by the way, certainly in this country, which has never been defined. So it can literally mean anything, which is really, really scary. So, so I think there's just historically very little reason to trust that these agencies appear to have our well-being in mind. There's just very little proof for that position. And yeah, that I, I, is the problem. Yeah, I just say that no government can trust any of the intelligence agencies they've created. Period. Yes, it's fine if the uh, <coughs> people who run the agencies are, so to speak, strictly moral, except in cases of necessity. But when they misuse the power they have, which they have the authority to misuse, then that's bad. But if yeah. people like, technical people like us, keep throwing them powerful technical tools day after day after day, here, here's a new toy, new toy, new toy, work with this, play with this, use this, then then it's, it's almost unsurprising that, that, that they realize they have this giant vat of, of, of power they can, they, can, they can wield and exert, and they're going to do that. And we are the suppliers of that. We produce those tools. We write that code. We write those algorithms. We, we, we develop those techniques. That's us. So if we're going to, point, if we're going to start you know, pointing the finger at, at, at you know, these higher level you know, managers who, and, 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 and entities that are, that are doing this, we have to take some responsibility ourselves for empowering them to do it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to thank William for um, fighting the lawsuits that you're fighting, yeah. and I hope that you end up with something like a church commission that will actually have some teeth. Um, <coughs> I was wondering whether, and this is probably I prefer the question that was asked in front, um, whether you've looked into um, the laws that protect the rights of children as another possible leader. Yeah, I, we, in fact, uh, I raised that over here in the UK. Uh, when I was here last, uh, testifying in the, the House of Lords. Yeah, I raised it with some people here, yeah. I mean, it's, it's scarfed up just like all the data. It's a part of the, all the data, and they're just taking it all in. So they're in there, too. So and there's no filtering. If a 10-year-old if a writes some email or something, that's... It's in the base. It. So, so things like the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So children have special. Not everyone here might know this, but children have um, greater human rights, essentially, than, than adults do because of right. the fact that they have. Um, but it's in. But it, but it didn't seem to make any difference with the investigative powers bill vote in the in the House of Lords. So. I'm not saying that was the right outcome. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, the US uh, and the most Western intelligent agencies have a quite a long history of toppling <coughs> in other regions of the world and being very heavily involved in directing <clears throat> politics. So how long and to what extent do you think that the US intelligence agencies have been directing these methods at their own government uh, to further their ends. Uh, we actually did a, Kirk Weeby and I did a study on that, okay. How much time in the existence of NSA have they not been spying on U.S. citizens? Um, well, the Shamrock program ran from, ran from uh, uh, the World War II, started uh, beginning of World War II, all the way up into 1975, about that time. The Church Committee kind of stopped that. Then uh, the, the Minaret program was picked up by Nixon and carried it uh, from uh, 68, I think, to about uh, 75 again, or so maybe 76. And uh, it, there was some spying even on the church committee afterward. The primary target there was Senator Church <laughs> because they had to know what he was going to thinking, what he was thinking, where he was taking the committee, and what he was planning. <laughs> For, for NSA and the other uh, FBI and CIA, those are the three primary targets of that committee. So uh, we ended up saying that uh, at, at most uh, we can only prove that they weren't spying on U.S. citizens 40 percent of the time they existed. So about 60 percent they were doing it, 40 percent we couldn't say. Right. Yeah. Um, probably a trivial question. What's your what, what would your what's your reaction to the suspicions raised about Kaspersky's software? Um, well, I, you know, I, I I I'm not sure about all the suspicions. I think what they're trying to do is discredit him, uh, discredit him as a as a source of uh, for you know cybersecurity or cyber comments on security, uh, and that that's probably because they want to uh, discredit anybody who might give a different opinion. Right, like for example, the Russians did it, of course. Right, everybody says that, right? But if you ask them, what is the evidence you have? They don't have any. They can't produce any. But the mainstream media is. This is what Adolf Hitler did. Hitler did this. So I mean, all all dictators do this. They simply, if they if they want people to do something, they create a lie, make it a big one, tell it off until everybody believes it, and get multiple sources to say it from all different directions, so that people say, oh, that must be true. You know. That's the fall fallacy of repetition, right? There's no evidence behind any of it. In fact, uh, what uh, Aryan had mentioned, we, 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 uh, when we found out that they were downloading 16 gigabits in 87 seconds of the DNC server, we said, well, how the hell could that get the Russia across the network? Well, it can't. I mean, we can't even, the most speed we got was 12 megabytes per, per second. That's it. And we needed something like uh, four times that because the highest rate of transfer was 38 megabits per second in that transfer. I mean, so, you know, a, we said it had to, that had to go locally. <laughs> it couldn't go well, across transfer the network. The transfer is remarkably <clears throat> close to USB 3.1 yeah, yeah. storage device. That's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so it looked pretty local to us, so, you know, we certainly had the proof that we couldn't go very far. The other thing, of course, with antivirus is basically if you're running an operating system that requires antivirus software, then your problem is you're running a wrong operating system. Um, the best XKCD <coughs> comic I've seen about this that really explains it all was about the fact that Diebold proudly announced that they were now running antivirus systems on their voting computers. <laughs> And somebody said, well, that's, surely that's better than having not antivirus what? software on the voting computers. And then, so, this is the brilliant of the comic explained it well. Well, imagine you're a parent and you come to the teacher's evening, and the teacher tells you, well, look, whenever I'm teaching, I'm always wearing a condom. <laughs> better than none, but somehow something is very, very wrong here. Right? Yeah. So, if you're using an operating system that needs a virus scanner to survive on the internet, get another operating system, seriously. Well, it could depend on the reason for wearing the condom, but... <laughs>
that you created this system, this monster, I think you called it, and then you say you, you then said that you were responsible for, for speaking up about it, that it as yeah. it's, as it's misused. How do you what would you say to someone else who's done something, who's created something in a similar position to you, where you've created something that, that turns out to be very powerful and starts to be very misused? How would you advise someone like that? Just to have well, it, I mean, do a, a technical person, a mathematician, computer scientist. Well, I mean, uh, the, the point is if what you create is subverted and uh, <clears throat> used for malicious purposes, uh, <clears throat> then you bear some responsibility in the capacity to be able to do that. And that's when you have to stand up and speak against it. That's the only thing you can do. I mean, you, I call the cutting, cutting edge, uh, the cutting edge of technologies the bleeding edge also. You know, on one side you bleed, the other side you're, you're making progress cutting through technology. Right? So, but uh, the, again, there's two edge, uh, it's a two-edged sword with uh, how things are used. I mean, you create something for good, and it could do good, but uh, when you get people who are corrupt and, some, you know, criminal, involved in the process of deciding how this capability is used, they can subvert it. And that's exactly what happened to us. So uh, they, they used it for criminal purposes. So I, I have to speak up publicly. And that, that's to shine light on their criminality. That's what they're afraid of. Yeah. Um, There's a question in the back. Um, if you're in, in that situation, just to take this a little further, <coughs> uh, if you're aware <coughs> of vulnerabilities <coughs> Yeah, let's call them vulnerabilities in whatever tool you have produced. Do you feel you have a duty to um, spread that knowledge about if the tool is being misused so that it can no longer be misused or can be misused but with lesser effect? Yeah, but unfortunately I don't know one. <laughs> okay. If I did, I would say, you know, here's, well, I, I tell them how they should be doing it. They should be using a targeted, directed, focused attack on the data so that you get people who are really trying to do something criminal and get rid of all this other stuff and don't even have it because it, it wastes your time and energy and effort. That's the way to really do it. Uh, and in fact, I've published several articles telling them how to do it with deductive, inductive, and abductive logic. Um, and uh, and they, uh, I can't force them to do it because I'm not in it. Uh, Although I might be again, I don't know. If that happens, I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, if I had the opportunity, I would fix that that way, and give people privacy, and force it. I mean, just uh, if somebody got in the road, I'd put him in the loading dock. You can manage the loading dock or something. You know. No, no flavor of logic. No. Has any power <clears throat> of the No. I mean, when you're mentally impaired, you're mentally impaired. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think we time for one more question before we get kicked out of the room. So, please. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so at the moment, it seems there's a very big picture with national security. So the NSA collects what's going on, actually analyze it, and they just store it. Is that just the end of the story and there's nothing else and we're all screwed? Or are there other things being done at the moment? Um, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, I don't know, and it seems like somebody was interested in national security. It is like leading the good joint because at the moment, it seems like, say, if you're joining the NSA or something, you should be propagating, you know, the so is there anything that you can be doing that's more less more, more concrete than just um, that was really said? Well, if you can't sue the bastards, okay, and you have no grounds for suit, uh, why you can support organizations, the uh, privacy organizations or civil liberties organizations. Uh, we have a group, a uh, coalition in the United States that has a reach, outreach to about 10 million people in the U.S., and we're working with them to try to get, uh, uh, and also with come members of Congress, we have a Fourth Amendment group in Congress that uh, wants to support uh, changes in, uh, in this, what they're doing. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, after the Snowden material came out in late July of 2013, um, the, uh, uh, Representatives Amos and Conyers, Republican and Democrat, formed a coalition in the Congress of the U.S., uh, the House, and uh, w uh, put a bill together to unfund the NSA activities. I was supposed to talk to them to give them some idea of what was really going on so they'd understand it. Well, when, uh, when a date and time was uh, considered for that, talk, it was published, of course, in the congressional record, you know, so-and-so is coming down to talk to such-and-such such a group about such-and-such. Such. That all goes in the congressional record. 
Well, when that happened, then <clears throat> the then President Obama called a meeting of all the Democrats in the House at that date and time. So they killed that meeting. That was four days before the vote. And so then the vote happened in the House, and they had been lobbying Obama and Alexander, the uh, head of the NSA, had been lobbying to stop this uh, pretty heavily with all the members of Congress. And so they lost the vote by 12 votes out of 435 in the House, four days after I was supposed to talk, but uh, Obama, that's how you subvert the process, okay? And this is what they do. But if you're a mathematician or a computer scientist <coughs> or technically inclined or, you know, the smart kid in the neighborhood who fixes people's computers, then you can help them get on systems that maybe are better than what we have now because they're out there and people need help getting there. And yeah. you know, <coughs> we need people to build those systems and make them better and get us better crypto yep. and get us better architectures. And there is a ton of work to do. And actually, it's amazing if you can be part of that work and if you can help build systems that will free people from some of this stuff, <coughs> then that is probably one of the greatest things you can do and probably as a professional in your life. Now, maybe you won't get as rich as some, you know, asshole who destroys everybody's privacy, like Mr. Zuckerberg, but I think you're probably actually, still better at that. Actually, he has 1.5 billion slave labor. They all work for him, for nothing. <coughs> anyway, I, I would say when you're doing these things, always think, think out of the box. Don't think conventional. You know what the conventional is. Think, think differently. Think of a different way of doing things. You know, that, that, that's the, how you can be creative. That's the fun part of it anyway. So if you can do these things and mess over everybody's mind because they don't know what's going on, that's great, you know. All right. I think we need to leave it there. So let's put our hands together for Bill right. and Diane. <laughs>